Herzlich willkommen zu unserer Veranstaltung. Welcome to our seminar, the Georgian Elections 2020 and measurement of the democratization. My name is Stefan Meiser. I'm at the head of the Tbilisi office uh, for Southern Caucasus uh, for the Bill Foundation. I would now like to start off with a few housekeeping remarks and then repeat the same contents in English um, and then stick to the English language because the majority of our panelists will speak English. In order for you to know, um, yeah, those who speak German in uh, the um, um, you have to click on uh, the globe button and then select uh, the uh, language that you want to speak and listen to, which is German. So please click on the globe button, the icon down below, and uh, so you can follow the German um, language. This is the first technical remark. and. Um, then we don't have the possibility to listen to the questions or ask questions directly. Um, uh, this is only possible through Q&A and um, can have or have to record um, and type the questions in the Q&A and my colleague will then read out uh, the uh, questions and will then answer it to um, Maybe uh, you can ask the questions uh, because of technical reason you cannot listen to. Hmm. Can you listen to me? So now I'm in English speaking. Yes. Uh, you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, warm welcome from my side uh, to our um, our event, uh, Pal uh, Georgian Parliamentary Election uh, 2020. Um, a measure um, of uh, democratization. Um, this is an event of uh, Heinrich Böll Foundation. Um, my name is uh, Stefan Meister. I'm heading the South Caucasus office um, of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Um, and I'm very happy that you joined our discussion rightly after the parliamentary election from uh, Saturday. Um, just uh, very short um, uh, technical remarks. Um, if you speak or, or listen in English, please go down uh, to the right. Uh, and choose on the globe English. Yeah, so please, please go down with the cursor uh, and choose the, the, the globe um, and English language, uh, and you will have an English uh, translation. We will have most of the speakers will speak in English, but you have to choose a language. Um, only one speaker will uh, speak in uh, German. Um, secondly, um, you cannot directly ask questions, um, you have to, um, uh, to write your questions in QA. Um, so this is also downstairs in the middle, you, you find Q&A and you can write down there your questions and my colleague will then later read the questions and the panelists uh, will, will answer them. So, okay, I think we now have um, uh, the technical, we have clarified the technical questions. If, if there are any technical, technical problems, please also write into the Q&A uh, and our technical assistant uh, will answer your questions. Um, so let's let me just uh, shortly introduce um, the event and also the, the panelists. Um, the main aim of this event is to discuss the current state um, of Georgian demo democracy um, in the light of parliamentary election, uh, which took place last Saturday uh, on October the, the 31st. Um, there is a lot of criticis criticism from analysts, um, civil society, um, and wider public that Georgia has backtracked in its uh, democratic development and is losing its path towards uh, modernization um, and the tr transatlantic integration somehow, or it's just slowed down and um, yeah, and, and it's, it's backtracking here. Uh, the dominant actors in current Georgian politics um, are uh, billionaire Bezina Ivanishvili and his party, Georgian Dream. Um, Ivanishvili took power um, from uh, Mikhail Saakashvili and uh, United National Movement in 2012 um, after a serial of scandals. After a first term in a coalition government, Georgian Dream had a second term with an absolute majority. And this term is now coming to an end. There is a growing criticism of stagnation of the reform process in the country on a growing impact of business people on Georgian politics and a stronger orientation towards Russia. This is, this is discussed um, in the wider public, but also in, uh, in expert circles and civil society. We could observe a strong polarization in uh, social media and public uh, or in, and on TV and private TV, uh, first of all, before the election. 
At the same time, the current government managed well the COVID-19 pandemic in spring this year and got a lot of credit for its consequent lockdown policy and, and managing of this, um, of this pandemic. With this election, it would be now the third term in government for Georgian Dream. <clears throat> Many expected that with new electoral law, uh, more parties will come into the parliament and there will be a need for a coalition. The party threshold has decreased from five to 1%, which makes it easier also for smaller parties to join the parliament. This year, Georgians voted in, for the first time in a mixed system, mixed system where 120 uh, members of parliament were proportionally elected in a single nationwide constituency through closed party lists, and 30 MPs are elected in single member constituencies. There will be a second round on November the 21st, because um, in uh, only uh, in, in around half of the single member constituencies, uh, uh, no candidate uh, has reached more than 50%. Um, to form a government, it needs more than 40, 45% uh, percent of the votes. According to the Central Election Commission, Georgian Dream won 48% um, percent and United National Movement as the second uh, strongest party, 27% of the votes. The opposition does not recognize the result and argues with several frauds in the uh, pre-election, but also election process. Demonstrations took place um, yesterday on Sunday and are planned for next Sunday. Um, we have today four speakers um, who will have around seven to 10 minutes to give a short input. And then um, I will have one follow-up question. And afterwards, uh, we will pick up your questions from uh, Q&A um, uh, to, to ask to the, to the speakers. Um, I just shortly introduce um, the speakers today. Uh, we have um, Elena Nisharadze, who is Executive Director of uh, International Society for Fair Elections and Democracy, ISFET, uh, here in Tbilisi, um, one of the most important, or maybe the most important um, election and election observation organization um, uh, in, in Georgia, and also part of a network of um, election observation and election and democ democracy um, NGOs. Uh, we have uh, Corneli Kakacha, who is director um, of Georgian Institute for Politics and professor at the Tbilisi State University, um, a strong expert on, on foreign policy issues um, and also Georgian relations towards the EU, but also on many other issues. Uh, we have Georgi Maisoratze, um, who is a philosopher but, um, and also professor at Ilya State University um, here in Tbilisi. Um, he, he, uh, he's, I think, one of the well-known intellectual also in, in, in Georgia, um, dealing with different uh, kinds of uh, different topics of politics. Uh, and he knows also Germany quite well uh, and worked also in Germany at, at university. Um, he will speak um, in German as the only speaker. Um, and we have um, uh, with a visual comment, Anna Giapshipa, um, who is an artist and filmmaker um, uh, and uh, who will start also today um, with a uh, with a slideshow um, uh, of, the, of the election campaign and um, yeah, with, um, just to give you some visu visual, um, uh, um, uh, um, visual um, background on, on the election. Um, so let's start with Anna, um, uh, with your slideshow. And I, Anna, I would also like to ask you, um, what is the atmosphere or what was the atmosphere in the context of the election campaign? What is the mood in the society? Um, and what, what does election mean for, for Georgians. Um, yeah, please, Anna, it's, it's your turn. Thank you, Stefan, for the question. And I'm honored to open this discussion and afterwards listen to other speakers' insights and uh, that are also very interesting to me. To return to your question about the mood and in the context of the elections, I have started to think about this presentation before elections past week, but things and moods change so rapidly here, it's rather complicated to follow them. I have prepared a small slideshow that resembles the main points of your question, and it deals with a pre-election period mostly. Uh, and I have a, today a role of the visual commentator and not politician, but uh, my images that I have collected recently in the streets of Tbilisi and in other cities of Georgia would tell much more about what the elections seem to mean to Georgians. And the other side, on the other side, uh, what they mean for political parties that occupy the walls of the country nowadays. 
Um, before starting the slideshow, let me explain that the images I will present here were not taken especially for this discussion, but rather that is my personal passion to collect words, posters, announcements, and their correlation between each other in the streets everywhere I'm staying in, so, and in Tbilisi as well. So these images and words I encounter um, uh, daily articulate the general mood on society about atmosphere um, much more loudly sometimes and openly than any media would um, would express or my bubble in digital world would write about that. So I have started to co to collect that atmosphere for several years now. Election posters, their placements on the walls, buildings, and even trees, um, their placement on the trees, and the words and advertisements, announcements beside or below or on them are additional sensors to understand what is going on in, on the other side of these happy faces on the politicians, on the posters, promising great future of the country. So I will start to share the presentation now. Um. Okay. This is the uh, first image um, that I would like to start with uh, that questions elections generally. It's written elections in Georgian words with a question mark on it. And I have taken this picture at one of the major streets in Tbilisi. And this place is just next to the one of the biggest uh, theaters in the city. Probably this particular empty space was usually used for theatrical posters. And, and, but as you may know, all the theaters, cinemas and everything is closed due to the coronavirus. Um, and throughout this month, there were not any support nor promise when they should reopen or how people that are employed in this sector would survive. Nor I remember any political party seriously mentioning the importance, role and position of the culture in their political agendas. For me, that encounter would express the frustration and probably not only frustration about this uh, concrete issue, but general frustration and annoyance, what exactly these elections would change or mean for Georgians. Um, and this another picture poster is from Georgian Dream Party, representative from one of the districts in Tbilisi, Tatsminda. Uh, it is situated near the place that I live in, and this place was um, recently rehabilitated. And I think this image expresses this gentrification process this district is undergoing currently. My neighborhood was a place for repair shops and low income craftsmen would rent the workshop places around. But after rehabilitation, there is no place for them anymore here. And I find it very ironical, all the mess of local renovation process around the poster and promise for a brighter future from the ruling party together to the Georgian success. It is written on the walls of the poster. And I think this picture resembles this irony of this promise, especially after election nights. Another uh, poster I have encountered, um, the dozens of that kind of posters from opposition party, European Georgia, on the road to the West Georgia. It was strikingly the big number of them glued on the highway. Besides, it looked rather ugly and very ecologically unfriendly. These names on the poster that were permanently seen from the window showed the names of the three men from this party that actively opposed the amendment of the electoral code about the gender quota system. Ironically enough, one of the posters of the road is glued on the inscription that would be partly read and it starts with the word manly, but I don't know how it continues, but it also is uh, rather ironic. This poster uh, from another opposition party leaders in the streets of Tbilisi. I don't remember any recent elections without the image of Shalva Natalashvili, a lucky leader from the Labour Party, who was a recent hero of uniting opposition parties against the ruling party of Georgian Dream. Sarcastically enough, this poster posted at one of the street light columns in the center of the city was soon filled with advertisement announcements that is looking for a Russian produced second hand technique to purchase. By the way, his election campaign also was marked as one of the most misogynist among others. Another um, eye-catching observation is to observe the layers of the posters. This specific poster from opposition party Strategia Mashanabeli was taken at the main avenue of Tbilisi, Rustaveli Avenue, and the aggressive campaign from this party was intense not only through the posters in the street, but also included telephone calls, phone messages, and other use of the private space and information. Um, 
this way this poster is torn is also rather symbolic. I think it's also logical that nobody wants to see the face of this poster that has an image of one of the openly homophobic, sexist and xenophobic representative of one of the opposition political parties. Um, these two posters are not from the current elections, but they are quite old. This is a good example how long these posters are kept on the walls of the city, how much energy and resources are used and they are still occupying this wall after several years of the elections. I'm meeting these posters every day, but even I don't remember the names or, and the faces on it. Um, what is above the first poster is a rental announcement on it and what is below her, I don't know exactly, but uh, for me, this is a, this both images are these images of the nihilism uh, and that we have towards local politicians uh, for the same, to seeing the same faces over and over that we tend to forget sometimes and only these images just remind us that they exist. Uh, they're becoming the ghost images that we encounter on the walls on the streets and we don't really remember their deeds after the elections in parliament or any other power structure um, and the last image i want to show is also symbolic as it reveals probably not only mind but general mood in society the posters are hanged below the e sign of the scrap buying announcement after boycotting and rejecting the seats at the parliament the opposition party seemed to resemble that image and also strengthen the mood that, uh, of mistrust of the voters that try to have diversified parliament through the giving their voice and trust to them this is uh, shortly <laughs> the visual commentary of the images that I met recently and um, I will be open to questions afterwards and if you have additional things that you are interested in. Thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for inviting me to the discussion. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much, um, Anna. Um, thank you for this uh, visual impression. I think that's, uh, it is really amazing how um, how Tbilisi and, and cities are also in, in, um, in Georgia are postered. Uh, and I really ask myself how, how much this impacts really the society. So it is uh, there's huge money spent also for, for this kind of election campaign. Um, and it's, I think it's really a question for whom this is made in the end. Um, um, I'm sometimes asking myself, can I just ask you a, a, in another direction, a follow up question, you mentioned your own bubble. Um, uh, yeah, so and um, in Georgia, Facebook and social media plays, plays a crucial role and everything is somehow public um, through social media. Um, uh, what role um, of social media in, in, this, in this election and in this election campaign? Uh, where, where do you see um, you know, where do you see social media here? What, what, uh, how was it somehow manipulated? Was it used? Uh, was it important for the campaign? Um, how people exchange each other? What, what, what would you be reading of, um, of this? For me, actually, social media is a source of getting the information as long as I do not watch TV and I try to avoid all this um, information that I get through the media. So the um, social media is the kind of source of information for me. And it was quite diversified. My social bubble was this diversified, but still I, I felt this frustration. Uh, was it from the general ruling party or from the opposition? I, in my small social bubble, I felt this frustration all over and over and before the elections and after elections also. Mm -hmm. mm, and maybe one, one additional question. Um, did people really ex um, expect change? So if, if, you, if you see all these posters, if you see, uh, follow all, the, all those discussions, so what, what people really expected, also from, a, from an emotional point of view, yeah? So from a, from a, from a public discussion view. I think people would expect this diversification in the parliament. Actually, that was the main thing that we're uh, optimistic about. And the main frustration probably came uh, afterwards uh, that election was forged and uh, they did not get this result of diversified parliament. And also I can sense this frustration um, uh, uh, towards the opposition that boycotted uh, the, their places in the parliament. And um, generally, yes, I, personally for me, I was not expecting the biggest big, big changes <laughs> in these elections. And uh, I was not hoping for the bigger changes uh, but um, my frustration stayed the same as it was before elections and after elections. So I do not have any political party that resemble my interest and um, in their agendas, I do not read the um, specific uh, things that would um, 
change concretely in next four years. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I switch uh, to, to Elena. Um, uh, ISFET had, uh, I think, 1,000 observers um, I read uh, all over the country. Uh, you published several reports, and I can imagine uh, how busy you were uh, around the election as, as, a, as, a, as the key watchdog, I would say, um, of, of the election. Can you maybe also a little bit more technically um, uh, describe what are your main findings um, before and uh, on the election day? Um, and what does the process say about the state of democracy in the country? Um, uh, but, but also describe somehow what are the key findings from your perspective? What surprised you maybe? Um, uh, what did you expect? Um, yeah, so yeah, it would be really interesting to, to get your feedback also from your observations and from your observers also. Thank you very much for organizing this meeting and in inviting me. Uh, it's great honor to be here and to talk uh, and discuss this very important issue because um, for our organization, election is the most important issue that we are um, and we are observing elections in Georgia for already 25 years. So uh, just before saying a few words about the election day, I just wanted to uh, say also uh, shortly that as you rightly mentioned in the introduction, this was very important uh, and it is very important elections, parliamentary elections for Georgia because uh, because of several reasons, uh, because of electoral change, the electoral system, which of course increased the chances for all pol uh, political parties to receive mandates in the parliament. Uh, and we really hoped for a multi-party um, parliament um, uh, and less uh, the domination on, of one political party. Uh, second, of course, it was important because for Georgian Dreams, the ruling party it was the second term, and um, uh, from our experience, it is usually the maximum uh, of for every ruling party. So it was kind of a test uh, for. Um, Georgian dream you know, whether it uh, would have managed to maintain the power or not. And third, of course, uh, the specific, very extraordinary situation created by uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which of course was very challenging for everyone, all stakeholders involved in the elections. Uh, so regarding a uh, few words regarding pre-election campaign, we have um, we started monitoring since 1st June, uh, because in Georgia, usually uh, the main, most important tendencies of violations um, uh, can be identified a, a couple of months ahead of elections. Uh, and we had um, uh, our long-term observers throughout Georgia in every municipality. And I should say that, uh, unfortunately, uh, there we are happening many different types of violations, starting from vote buying, also abuse of state resources, which is always um, uh, is carried out by a ruling political party and it gives of course huge advantage to uh, one political parties and for these elections the new challenge was also social projects um, uh, which we are initiated and justified uh, in, re uh, in relation with the COVID uh, pandemic and of course we realize and we uh, know that uh, citizens uh, really need assistance um, because they, are, they have many social economic problems, which was uh, even more deteriorated by the pandemic. But the problem uh, with these social projects was that uh, many of them, we are not uh, substantially justified uh, and they raised questions that these uh, projects and accordingly as the uh, budgetary funds we are used for political purposes you know, for one uh, for the interests of one political party and again in georgia it has huge influence on the voters because the problem is not only that it's abuse of state resources uh and it is done for the interests of in the advantage of one political party but uh due to the you know, political culture here these projects are also presented as uh, carried out by political party and um, uh, both citizens as affiliate this project um, with a political party, not the state authorities. Um, and, and this is, of course, uh, is a huge problem, uh, which we also had uh, for these elections. And 
the most problematic violations were, were related with the intimidation, harassment cases, with, uh, and also physical violence. And the number of this type of um, uh, violations increased, especially after the official uh, commencement of pre-election campaign. And uh, the problem is not only the violation, but another uh, problem is that um, uh, law enforcement authorities are reluctant to investigate these type of violations. Uh, usually what happens is that investigation is uh, uh, initiated, it started, we receive information about it, but uh, we never receive um, information about the results of the uh, investigation or the number of cases investigated are very low which do, uh, really do not uh, uh, have any influence uh, on the elections and it does not have this preventive effect that it should uh, has uh, and which is uh, very important. Uh, so um, that was of course problematic uh, and um, uh, we have issued like six uh, monitoring reports uh, of pre-election campaign and of course we are like um, uh, we, we, we are also like uh, observing uh, e-day procedures and as you said we had 1,000 observers throughout the whole country um, uh, and during the day we were receiving uh, information about the different types of violations happening and it was also very uh, diverse these violations uh, most important related with uh, during the day with the secrecy of vote. Also, we had like quite increased number of uh, pressuring or um, interfering in the work of our observers uh, and aggression uh, towards them, especially from co uh, election commission members. We have uh, we had also detected cases of so-called uh, party coordinators. Uh, that is a very negative experience here in Georgia. These are the people who are um, uh, mobilized outside the polling stations and uh, they are controlling uh, the voters who is coming. And uh, this may be a normal practice in other countries, but in Georgia we uh, consider and uh, we perceive that this method is used in order to pressure voters and um, uh, especially when it uh, concerns uh, civil servants and other um, groups of vulnerable groups uh, who are like dependent on the um, uh, different social benefits they are receiving from the state and they are usually threatened, uh, intimidated that they will use uh, these benefits or they will have some problems at their workplace. Uh, and of course, there were some different other types of violations and most important tendencies that we have identified um, uh, during uh, like counting and tabulation process is a very high number of uh, protocols with uh, mismatch of uh, data, which means uh, they, there was not a balance. Uh, between the ballot papers and the vote, the number of voters who voted, which uh, should be equal, but uh, we had many uh, polling stations when the number of ballots were higher uh, than the voters who participated in the elections. Uh, and according to our results, it was 8%, which is very high, and we have never identified such a high number of this uh, problem. And of course, this raises certain questions. Uh, regarding the trust uh, towards elections. And also, as we said, it could uh, have influenced the results of um, uh, political subject, political parties uh, who participated in the elections. Um, and um, uh, with our recommendation in this respect is that Central Election Commission should be re um, recount uh, these polling stations in order to have objective answers uh, what type of problem was it and what caused this uh, problem. Uh, uh, we think that uh, this is the only outcome and uh, the problem here is that uh, in the, uh, with our past experience uh, in case of this type of violations which, uh, which is very serious uh, um, uh, the approach was um, very negative uh, uh, from uh, from the side of election administration uh, when they rejected all our complaints to 
you know, recount this type of polling station and instead of this, they were correcting the data in the protocols based on explanations written by the commission members who made uh, these type of mistakes, which of course is, uh, is, uh, is not uh, something that uh, any stakeholders can trust and it's not right approach and it's not objective evidence in order to show what was the problem why we had so many ballots in the ballot box when uh, they should not have been there. Uh, so uh, our um, we have very like, strict um, uh, position on these issues that uh, the only um, uh, right approach is uh, to recount these uh, polling stations in order to have trust towards elections, in order to have trust towards uh, election administration itself and only uh, making this uh correcting protocols based on uh any explanations of the commission uh, members is not enough uh so uh and uh yes uh there were also other types of violations i will not go into uh, yeah yes. i will not go into uh, much details but now overall uh we can say that unfortunately this uh was not uh the elections that we wanted to have it was not uh it was a step i could can say that it was kind of step back um in the conduct of elections mm, and um, it was very negative pre-election campaign and uh election day as well and of course um this is very sad fact but and i'm not uh, i don't like to say it but this is a reality uh, and um, uh, we really uh, need uh, not only to improve like general political culture in the country, uh, but it's also uh, very obvious that we need to work very hard in order uh, to improve the election standards uh, in Georgia in order to satisfy the, uh, those international standards uh, that every democratic state should have uh, when it comes about uh, conduct of elections. Uh, and uh, in order to have like trust towards elections, not only from the side of stakeholders, but also from the side of voters, which of course is very much uh, influences their decision whether to go and participate in the elections or not. And so this is very shortly, of course, I can speak a lot, but I do not want uh, to go into very much uh, technical details also. Um, and I will be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. I think uh, <clears throat> there are really very important um, observations um, you did. Um, I just want to um, um, just to want to say again, you can everybody can ask already questions in Q and A, uh, but please we don't take any anonymous questions. Yeah, so please name yourself that we can also recognize who is asking questions, and we will not take questions from un anonymous uh, persons. Um, coming back to you, uh, Elena, um, mm -hmm. I just want to ask you how the pandemic influenced uh, the whole election process was it somehow used um uh, also yeah in, uh, by by for instance by the ruling party uh, and and what impact it had on it before and also uh, during uh, the election that's yeah, a very important question thank you for asking it yeah a pandemic as i said was very, a huge challenge of course for the elections uh, as I said, uh, the problem was that uh, the regulations that was adopted by the Central Election Commission uh, just uh, two weeks before elections, it was like you know, giving very short period of time for the voters who were in isolation, in quarantine, uh, to request the mobile box because they were given right to vote only be, uh, by mobile box. Uh, because of the high risks of health. So it was identified uh, two days that was very objectively obvious from the beginning that it was very short uh, time uh, because of the increasing number of uh, in, uh, infectious, uh, infected uh, people. Uh, and uh, of course, later though, it was uh, prolonged for one more day, which again proves that the initial time period was not uh, objective and uh, was not enough, but still there were many voters who were complaining that they could not um, uh, like contact a central election commission in order to register for the mobile uh, box, uh, or they were not they were infected uh, with COVID nineteen. They were at home, staying at home for treatment, but. 
uh, they were not uh, registered in the list uh, of uh, Ministry of Health. So it showed two problems. So one problem from uh, the Ministry of Health and how this uh, issue is regulated and dealt uh, with, uh, and on the other side, uh, the problems from Central Election Commission that the time frame provided for the voters was not enough to register uh, for you know, receiving mob, uh, mobile uh, ballot box uh, and many of these people could not participate in elections and today I also received information that there were some voters who were registered in the list, they were waiting for the whole day for the mobile ballot boxes but they still have not received it. So mobile ballot box, commission members with the mobile ballot box did not go to them for vote and they could not vote. So that, that was like a serious challenge that we consider uh, that was not uh, dealt in a proper way, unfortunately, and people, some voters could not vote uh, in these elections. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Al. Thank you very much. And one just very short follow-up question. I think one of the, the main uh, areas of fraud you, you have um, identified were the counting process and, <clears throat> and also the protocol, how, how they were done. Um, did it has an, had an impact that there were very limited international observers also in, in, in this election? So I participated as an international observer, but it was really a very low number because of the, of the pandemic. Uh, did this have an impact um, also on on the whole process? You mean low participation, low observation from international partners? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, uh, yeah, it was of course very sad that international observers could not come uh, because we were really were hoping that internationals could have been presented with large scale uh, missions. But of course, it's uh, understandable because the reasons were very objective that uh, they could not arrive. Uh, so they wanted to do it, but um, uh, of course it increased our role as uh, local observers and uh, our, uh, even like um, uh, made our findings even more important because also international observers are very much relying on our results and our findings in respect of whether it's pro-election campaign or uh, e-day. So, um, well, again, it said they could not come, uh, but uh, still we hope with a, a limited mission that uh, they could observe elections. So we'll still have um, a very valuable recommendations from their side, which uh, we are also using very effectively after elections, because after elections, the important process is also you know, working on legislative amendments uh, to different um, laws that regulate elections. So. I, I'm sure they will have very important re, uh, recommendations and of course we will do our best to provide them with the most updated and uh, correct information uh, as we have regarding elections and um, uh, generally pre-election campaign or uh, election day. Thank you very much. Um, and I just switch into German for, <laughs> for Kirogi. Georgi, um, <clears throat> how would you assess uh, the current election in views towards the other election uh, when we look at the democratic uh, development of Georgia and what does those elections reflect upon the relationship between society and uh, the government? Thank you so much, uh, Stefan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really delighted to be part of this panel discussion this afternoon and I would like to dig in directly. Yeah, for exactly 30 years, Georgia has had a democratic um, election system for the parliamentary election starting out in 1990, where we had the first parliamentary elections in October of 1990. And uh, we had certain uh, irregularities um, uh, quite a few indeed, and we always had the hope that uh, this would improve over the years, but uh, this time and these parliamentary elections in two, 2020 is um, quite uh, 
seems appalling because uh, we have a whole series of irregularities and of uh, discrepancies. Um, in the pre-election phase, uh, we had a few incidents, a very low level, because the problems, the issues that the society had to face, uh, the pandemic, of course, exacerbated the situation and made this more obvious. Uh, but uh, everything that is behind it um, is uh, the following, the social and economic problems problems. Uh, the pandemic has basically aggravated um, the weak economy in Georgia and has brought it uh, to a fall. The main problem is poverty in our country. When uh, the Western observers or tourists uh, come to Georgia and uh, um, Georgia is really proud of counting on more and more tourists every year that uh, they have the possibility to uh, enjoy their vacation in our country. We have many five-star hotels, two new Hilton hotels are about to be built in the capital, but it's all on the outside. It's all for say it, uh, that uh, we have the possibility to take advantage of all the entertainment. Uh, you can um, go out, uh, we have clubs, but all that uh, is concealed here is the poverty of the society. Everything that uh, the de facto ruler of the country has, uh, uh, yeah, I'm talking about Bedzina Ivanishvili, he is a multi billionaire and he has basically appropriated the country. He has privatized large parts of the economy, and by doing that, every public institution has simply become uh, a facade for everything that is happening behind it. And as a sole solution, what he presented after the uh, huge debates in summer about uh, the parliamentary elections to be taking place, um, the uh, reform of uh, the obsolete law or a few um, corrections. Uh, we were talking about um, the adoption of uh, the uh, uh, majority rule. And Ishvanishvili said that 2 million of Georgians should leave the country in order to seek an employment outside of the country. And he, being the father of uh, the nation, is uh, basically telling them that uh, they can count on his support. The population is a little bit less than 4 million. So he is advising for more than half the population to leave the country because there is no perspective for them. This is the issue that we have in our country. Uh, we are not talking about independent institutions, research institutes or NGOs or whatsoever, but we're talking about internal voices. This is something we have to solve. And so then on the other hand, the poverty is the main reason why the general elections um, or may it be munis uh, on the municipal level or on uh, the government level. This is the reason why those elections are so easy to manipulate. And we have seen pictures, we've seen videos as how um, the uh, um, um, different representatives have collected potatoes or uh, food, basically just basic food in order to provide this food for the most poor people or they have offered them money out and about and uh, it could be ridiculous uh, when we talk about the sums we're talking about 20 lari that's uh, not even 12 euros here in germany so this is what we're talking about when we talk about bribery of uh, or bribing the voters with those ridiculous sums. And this is something that uh, we have observed uh, for many, many years. So this last presidential uh, general election is no exception of the rule. Eleni already um, filled us in the situation, how uh, this election has been manipulated already in the pre-election phase. Uh, um, 
some people are even blackmailed. Uh, they are threatened with uh, um, losing their jobs uh, from public administration. So this is nothing new. This already happened uh, under the rule of Saakashvili, who is now representing the major op um, opposition party, the United National Movement, which has not been um, any surprise. And the tactics of Ishvanishvili have always been uh, in the last eight years. Um, what the Georgian dream, the ruling party of Georgia has claimed uh, for the last years that uh, we are better than the nationalist movement um, and uh, always threatening with uh, the return of Saakashvili and building up his torture system that he will uh, exercise revenge. So they did not offer any precise concrete solution that the ruling party offered. Uh, they hardly had any idea as how to solve uh, the country's problems, as how we could reform the economy of the country, but not only the economy, talking about the education that is basically um, in debris, the uh, social and cultural infrastructure, everything is uh, stagnating and um, breaking up and independently of the pandemic. So the hopes of the opposition parties is uh, when uh, the threshold was lowered to 1%, then uh, we would have the possibility to find a new way of governing or that we could include a whole spectrum of opposition parties in a coalition. Um, that all could be part of uh, the administration in the legislative process or in um, amendments. But but those hopes have been exaggerated because uh, um, there is a low rate of trust in those different parties from the society. Uh, Saakashvili and the United Nationalist Movement have produced some spin-offs uh, like the Georgian Movement. Uh, a few of the leaders from the Saakashvili government have uh, separated from the party and ideologically it's become quite clear what ideology they are pursuing. It is quite conservative, right, conservative, liberal, um, um, a movement, um, the European Georgia, for example, 3.5 percent is what they obtained in the elections, but uh, they uh, are well known. We know what they want, uh, and uh, the uh, promise was to lower the taxes and to decriminalize uh, the uh, economic criminals. So you can commit economic crimes and then uh, the alternative uh, position party says that uh, you are basically uh, freed if you commit a, an economic crime. So this uh, was uh, depicted as an alternative to the ruling party and uh, once again, right neoliberal conservative party. We have no single party here present in the election that have any idea about how to reform the social system. New parties that have emerged and were able to, to, to pass uh, the uh, barrier that have um, maybe received four to five seats. Lelo is a new, quite colorful movement uh, led by one of the most uh, affluent uh, bankiers. Mm. Three minutes left. So, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm extending my time here. Um, so, and we have Girti, for example, is uh, the, the pine cone uh, in German. We could maybe compare it to the Pirate Party in Germany, but uh, the biggest uh, difference between the Pirates in Europe and the Goethe Party is that they are fanatics of neoliberalism. They would like to uh, break up uh, the hardly existing social system, and uh, we could uh, 
basically compare them to a religious movement rather than a political party because this really has nothing to do with common sense and reason and they are receiving full mandates in the parliament and under these circumstances confidence trust or the hope that uh, the, those elections will change anything for the better there, there was hardly any any hope in the society and i was uh, quite surprised to see I don't know what the exact figure was, but uh, more than 50% of the population of uh, population entitled to vote really showed up in the polling stations. This was really a surprise because there was hardly any trust in the political system or the economic system. What has been reached so far is a uh, yeah, total nihilism. Nobody is hoping or um, seeing any political perspective um, that anything would improve for the better only through those elections. Hardly anybody hoped for that. The only objective was to um, to maintain uh, the uh, power of uh, Ivanishvili, ah, to, to end uh, the power of Ivanishvili, which was another slogan of our election system. Thank you so much for your perspective, which um, I think was uh, really important. 56% uh, voter turnout is what we observed here, higher than the last time. So maybe due to wanting to end uh, the power of Ivanishvili and the Georgian dream, this is uh, at least the way I perceived it. Um, one follow-up question about what's been said as well by Anna. Why aren't there any political alternatives? So why are there mainly neoliberal parties that dominate the picture and that don't have any interest in the needs of the population that really are not interested in the majority of society, but moreover representing a minority? Why aren't there any alternatives and where could they emerge from? Yeah, this is... A secret. It's a really a question I don't find any answer to because I hardly understand it myself why the majority of the parties are right wing parties. Uh, uh, they are now occupying the seats in our parliament the way they did the years before. It's really difficult to explain this phenomenon. I think the Soviet legacy would be a speculation, but it's already quite obsolete, although few are still fighting against uh, the Soviet uh, um, past, uh, starting off with the uh, Saakashvili. It is still quite vivid, the Soviet legacy, but um, maybe it's an indoctrination of people for many, many years. Uh, so the neoliberals um, have uh, totally have a grip on the education system. So they uh, produce um, their likes without asking any critical questions, without thinking of any substantial reform. The population in the society is weakened to such a degree that uh, there really is a huge gap between the political elites or the activist elites and the rest of the population that uh, basically on a daily basis have to fight um, poverty and have to fight for their subsistence. So I really do not understand why we don't see any socially oriented parties. So we had uh, those parties or a caricature of those party is something that um, could be compared to a Green Party. I would really love to vote for a Green Party, but, but there is no such thing. So I uh, hope would be that uh, the Greens could be founded, but they're basically too young. So they're basically uh, students and there's hardly anything else. We have the Labour Party, which is a more a ridiculized party uh, led by Natashvili. This is at least uh, my perception. I don't really have any idea why we only have right-wing and neoliberal parties. This is really, really 
something I cannot explain. This is uh, expressing the very low political culture in our country, unfortunately. Thank you very much. I just switch in, uh, back into English also we, that we can take some questions and uh, let's look in, onto the international level um, uh, with um, Corneli. Um, uh, Corneli, please also keep, keep the time. Uh, um, I already pushed here a little bit, but it's also very interesting. I think we have very diverse uh, kind of speakers. So what is the role of external players um, in the context of this election? Where do you see Georgia heading? Also, if you, if you, if you look into the trend with regard to transatlantic integration, the EU um, having also in mind a crisis in the EU itself, disinterest in, in Eastern partnership, um, and also the upcoming U.S. election, yeah, which uh, I think U.S. policy has really a different priority. Um, so where do you see this election here in, um, in Georgia's foreign policy and in Georgia's relations with its, with its international partners? Thank you, uh, uh, Stefan, for inviting me for this interesting panel. Uh, I think, uh, of course, I agree with uh, most of the speakers uh, that this uh, election was not really a uh, good example for the country which just started the Europeanization process. And interestingly, probably most of you remember that the ruling party before the election just put the, uh, in their program that they will actually officially apply for EU membership uh, in 2024. I can assure you with this kind of election, we will never uh, be able to secure any membership in any uh, meaningful uh, organization, including uh, NATO and uh, EU. So I think uh, one of the biggest uh, problem, and uh, we, we were seeing this problem already a few years ago, and we were warning about this uh, Georgia's partners, including European Union, United States, and other Western uh, you know, uh, actors. Basically, the Georgia is backsliding. Uh, and um, uh, I think that this election actually crystallize these uh, tendencies. And uh, uh, the one of the biggest challenge for Georgia is that, as, especially Georgia's Europeanization project and the Euro-Atlantic project is that you cannot really expect uh, to become member of uh, you know, democra any democratic club when you don't have uh, democracy inside a country. And if you are not able to uh, perform uh, or organize the election uh, the democratic way, I think uh, um, you should not really pin high hopes on uh, uh, on success in in Euro-Atlantic integration. And I think in that sense uh, we have a lot of challenges, but we also need um, uh, some support from uh, international actors, especially from EU, because EU and the United States has a huge leverage on Georgian politics and the foreign policy as well. So I understand that there's a lot of um, things going on. There's a tension in uh, uh, you know, um, in uh, transatlantic relations, there are some uh, huge problems inside the EU, and there was also election. Uh, there are some elections also United States, some other, and Georgia issue may not be the you know the the, the case uh, to to watch all the time. But I think uh, that if we want to somehow to uh, to help the democratization process in Georgia. We need somehow to use the leverage uh, uh, the EU and other institution has. And thanks God, so far, uh, Georgia uh, is responding, unlike some other post-Soviet country, uh, quite positively about this kind of uh, feedback from uh, international actors. And I think um, we need more clear, um, how to say, uh, I would say uh, propositions or even uh, I would say statements, and uh, I mean here the statements which we hear so far from international organization, including OSC and some other observation. I understand there there's a lot of idiomatic, uh, you know, expressions there, very diplomatic, and sometimes it's very difficult to find out what's going on. But sometimes we need to call spade uh, uh, spade, and I think here we have a little bit, um, how to say, uh, kind of. Um, unclear situation and a lot of uh, things also depends how, what will be the international reaction. We already hear what is the reaction inside the Georgia. And I think uh, we also need a candid um, kind of engagement and conversation uh, uh, over Georgia issue because 
Uh, I understand that Georgia may be a kind of shining star if you look at other Eastern European countries. But again, if we will look at what is the Georgian aim, and Georgia should not compare itself to its uh, immediate neighbors or in uh, some EIP countries, Georgia's aim is uh, uh, to become a member of European Union. Uh, and NATO, so it requires a little bit higher bar for measurement. And we should, um, I think, uh, uh, judge and uh, measure the success of Georgia. Uh, in the, uh, we, we should compare uh, to Georgia like to Slovakia or Estonia and some other countries. And, and uh, I think we, we need to be clear about this. And especially with uh, uh, you know, international assessment, uh, I think uh, we will see what, what will be the reaction. But one thing is clear that um, without public consensus, which is gone right now, I don't think that we will have a success in Euro-Atlantic integration. Because uh, what we hear now and uh, from the opposition, uh, uh, that if they're not going to join this parliament, we inevitably uh, will have a political crisis. And uh, uh, sooner or later, I don't know how, what will be the end of this uh, uh, and how, what will be the way out from this crisis, but it's already uh, clear that, uh, you know, uh, Georgia is uh, entering in very difficult uh, times and we need uh, more engagement for international actors. Thank you very much. Just very short one questions and then we go into the questions of the of the auditorium. There is always these critics that under <clears throat> the, the, the current government, um, there is a shift towards Russia. Um, uh, can you observe this? Um, would you also say that there is a clearly change uh, in the policy uh, in the priorities and that the Russian impact is growing in, in Georgia? I think it's uh, not so easy to answer this uh, question directly, but what one could say is that uh, this particular government, if you compare the previous government, is trying to be more uh, accommodated towards Russian geopolitical interest. And uh, uh, they claim that they are, um, this is because they are more pragmatic and they want to engage with Russia. And as you uh, all remember, uh, this particular government started in 2012, uh, the mm, so-called normalization policy with Russia, uh, where we had some successes in culture, education, and uh, you know uh, trade, but uh, we also uh, uh, reach uh, some sort of red uh, uh, lines, uh, and I think that was a little bit uh, unexpected from uh, Georgian Dream government because they were thinking that if they would uh, uh, you know try to somehow to meet uh, you know to, to, to engage Russia, uh, the Russia would reciprocate. But this, uh, as you as we can see. Uh, was not the case so far. So I think in overall, uh, um, if you compare this particular government and the former government, there's a, uh, some differences uh, in, in, in terms of relations with Russia, where the former government is more, um, I would say, uh, more aggressively uh, seeking the membership in NATO and the European Union and uh, less, uh, I would say, engaging with Russia. This particular government is trying um, somehow to uh, to uh, you know, accommodate Russian interest, but uh, I, I think it, it's not that easy uh, like it seems. Uh. I understand. Okay, thank you very much, Corneli. I would bring in my colleague uh, Katya uh, to pick up um, some some questions. Let's try to have maybe two rounds um, and have several questions. It would be great if they are addressed also to someone. And if not, then um, I would ask the panelists not to to answer all the questions, but really pick up uh, a few questions that we can take as much as questions as possible. So please, Katja, the turn is on you. Yeah, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm going to pick now some of your questions as, um, as there's about 100 attendees. Unfortunately, it cannot be all. So let's start right away with a bunch of questions on the vote fraud, on the uh, legitimacy of the elections. Um, Mariami Gigiguri wants to know, uh, what do you think about the fact that the elections have been forked and how legitimate is the OC OCE report in this case? And what do you think is the best solution to this situation? And is it, is it legitimate to hold another elections, especially in the times of Corona? Um, next uh, question. Maybe, maybe, maybe we uh, ask some and then- Okay, okay. Yeah. 
we collect some. Yeah, maybe you answer, you, we do a round and we have several questions and you just pick, it's on you, Elena, I think you should answer it, but there might be two or three more questions and you should answer them in a package to, to take more questions, please. Right, uh, the next one from our colleague, uh, Walter Kaufmann. He asks, uh, opposition representatives like former Speaker of Parliament, David Bakradze have called the elections illegitimate and announced the boycott for of further election and parliamentary process. Would you support this judgment? And are we witnessing the beginning of a deep political crisis in Georgia, including a parallel paralysis of political institutions? Or is this just the usual kind of political reaction in a polarized political culture? Also, um, some other questions uh, were raised and want to know if, if these elections can be called fair and uh, should they be internationally uh, recognized? Um, I could go on now with some questions on the role of opposition. Yeah, maybe you just take some more questions. Um, yeah, I... yes. um, Ikantian wants to know what role Saakashvili will um, play for Georgia in the future, if at all, um, as his, his party um, has a significant better uh, result now. Um, next question from... Um, from Mira Sovaka. Um, I also wondered whether Georgia's, no, this, let me switch to her first question. In light of significant presence of the uh, United National Movement in the new parliament and the serious animosity between them and the ruling party, what prospect do the speakers see for political decision-making processes in Georgia moving forward? Um, and also from her, um, the next question, I also wonder whether Georgia's pro protracted conflicts, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, did feature at all in this year's election campaigns and whether what is currently going on in the region in and around Nagorno-Karabakh has had and will have any impact on how the political actors might approach these conflicts. And maybe a last question that goes in the same direction by Mattia Nellis. How did the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict feature in the Georgian elections? Did Saakashvili's words of support for Azerbaijan, Aliyev have any electoral impact? And will Saakashvili now come back to Georgia to, to face criminal charges? This is the question by Mattia Nellis and mm -hmm. others also wanted to know if Saakashvili is coming back and what role will he have. Okay. That's the most popular question. Okay, let's give it to, to the panel um, and then have, a, have, a, have another round of questions. Maybe, Elena, we start with you on, on the frauds. Um, uh, yeah. First question, I think, is very important. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Well, yes, uh, as I said, uh, uh, what we have identified uh, as the most problematic trend for these uh, elections to uh, on day during counting and um, uh, uh, tabulation process, uh, uh, drafting of summary protocols is a huge tender, um, a huge number of uh, polling stations where uh, we had uh, this balance uh, in the pro summary protocols when uh, the ballots casted were more than uh, voters who participate. And of course, as I said, it raises questions um, uh, about the trust um, uh, towards elections. And of course, it could have uh, had some influence on the results uh, of the uh, political subjects. Uh, uh, but uh, and exactly for this, um, I, but we cannot say what was the reason for uh, this type of disbalance. Um, and the only official competitive uh, body which can answer this question uh, is um, election administration. So in this, in this case, we think that the only reasonable outcome is to recount the results at these uh, problematic polling stations and uh, to do it with uh, transparency, uh, with the participation of all uh, sta important uh, stakeholders like political parties, uh, local and international uh, observers, and uh, to uh, identify, to check uh, what was the problem of uh, this type of violation, which is very problematic. And of course, this raises questions um, about uh, trust towards elections. And uh, these questions is raised not only by us, but uh, as already said, by opposition political parties. 
Uh, so I think uh, now uh, the only answer uh, and responsibility for this uh, is on election administration. And uh, we really hope that uh, they will uh, show the will to deal with this problem uh, in a most adequate way uh, that will be acceptable for the wider society because this, uh, in this situation uh, that, can, uh, that can be a really a solution uh, to see why we had uh, this type of uh, problem on such a high number of polling uh, stations. So uh, otherwise, as uh, regards the uh, um, agenda of political parties and boycotting of uh, parliamentary work, of course, it's their uh, strategy. It's uh, the decision up to them uh, to make. Uh, and it's, of course, political decision. But of course, our position and my position as a representative of civil society organization is that uh, it's very important. Parliamentary life is very important, and uh, we wanted to have a multi-party parliament. And, uh, actually, um, uh, there will be nine uh, political, according to the results, there will be nine political parties represented in the parliament. And uh, I think it's very important that all uh, political parties, including opposition political parties, are presented in the parliament and are participating in the uh, decision making process and are representing the uh, interests of the voters, those voters who voted uh, for, uh, for them and um, who considered them um, uh, enough qualified uh, to be in the parliament and uh, to represent uh, them and uh, to take decisions on their behalf. So. It's our position, and let's see how the political processes will go on. But of course, uh, I understand that political parties uh, have their also their strategy and um, their agenda. But uh, like we hope that uh, at least the um, processes that is going uh, ongoing now in the country will uh, be peaceful uh, and will not have uh, cases of physical violence or no one will. Uh, like we had um, during previous manifestations uh, last year. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Georgi, I, I would ask you um, <clears throat> about, um, is there an upcoming political crisis um, also with uh, this lack of legitimacy and, and the role of Saakashvili? Maybe you can just say a couple of words um, on this. Also, politische Krise kann man sagen, es gibt schon da. The political crisis, so to say, I would say it's already present. That um, there's hardly any alternative uh, that can be elected. Uh, this shows, uh, showcases already uh, the uh, present political crisis. When it comes to Saakashvili, we can say that uh, already in the last uh, eight years, in each and every moment uh, when there was uh, dissatisfaction towards uh, Ivanishvili and the ruling party, and um, they said nothing else, then they would be better than Saakashvili and uh, that the threat uh, would prevail that Saakashvili would come back. And Saakashvili himself, he entered perfectly well in the game with the way he presented himself, with his allegations that uh, he wants to come back um, sailing or crossing the mountains. Uh, he, uh, his head is full of fantasy. So I need and every time his allegations, uh, the allegations of Saakashvili were used to just say, look, the threat is still there in order to avoid and to prevent it. We have to stay strong and uh, stay at the ruling party and all the other position parties have played along. All the different criticisms, criticisms uh, that uh, we encountered uh, were disqualified as the opinion of Saakashvili, uh, previous uh, parliamentary members, uh, people who are known to be liars. Uh, there is no doubt about it. There's no uh, pro and con perspective. He is a 
express liar in every single criticism every single opposition opinion was earmarked as being a, a threatening expression from Saakashvili and this is the problem that uh, we are left with those two possibilities those two options or Saakashvili or Ivadishvili, the two of them coexist, they need one another. And this coexistence is uh, by the fact that um, they simply face one another, that they are in constant uh, um, opposition and uh, d discussion. And uh, the way we've seen it in uh, the election outcome, there's hardly any alternative. We're not even talking about the two different parties. We're talking about those two people, Ivanishvili and Saakashvili. Okay. Thank you very much. I don't know if this has been, uh, yeah, too yeah. comprehensive. Um, thank you. I think it's all, it's, I think it's fine. I think it's really an important issue, also this kind of using each other and, and um, complementing somehow each other. Yeah, you can say. Um, Anna, do you want to add something on this issue uh, with regard to, to legitimization or um, um, the, 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 uh, the question in this direction also democratization? I think I will add rather add the, issues? I will rather add the comment about Abkhazia, Abkhazian issue that was also... Uh, okay, yes, yeah, sure. That, as long, uh, there was a question whether Abkhazia or South Society were present in the agendas of uh, our political parties. Uh, and I think that's uh, very important that that I've heard or read, um, there was no any mention of uh, conflict regions in political parties um, presentations. And I think it's very important because we all know the recent uh, um, statement from Abkhazia that they are kind of open for some kind of a dialogue with Georgia and the non-Georgian Dream and nor other parties um, said anything about this initiative. And um, uh, well, for me, uh, I think it's very important that none of the parties uh, would say anything concrete about the present or social society and issues and it stays on the level of the slogans and it doesn't have any influence on this political uh, process and um, election process unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Corneli on Karabakh and then there was an additional question on what stabilization means also with regard to the disputed region maybe you can also respond to this. <clears throat> okay, uh, regarding Karabakh, actually, um, there it was, it had no actually influence on Georgian elections, even though we are in the same region. Uh, I, I think this was not really issue in this election. Uh, regarding, there was few question uh, regarding Russia and, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, stabilization. I think the problem here is that Georgia, any government of Georgia actually w wants to have a friendly relations uh, with Russia but based on the territorial integrity of Georgia and uh, based on uh, the Georgia should have its uh, uh, own uh, foreign policy orientation. And I think there we have a huge differences because each country has uh, different views about the regional settings. And uh, I think the, uh, the Georgian and uh, Russian national narratives uh, are quite different and they look uh, quite, uh, uh, how to say, opposite and that's why it doesn't really matter who is uh, president in or in government in Georgia or in Russia I think it will not change until we don't change the narrative and uh, unfortunately the problem is that uh, the reality where we live that when 20 percent of Georgia's uh, territory is occupied I don't think that any government can engage with Russia uh, you know, like meaningfully, uh, is especially in, uh, taking into consideration that in order to uh, dance the tango, you need two. And the second, uh, uh, I would say, uh, actor here is missing. And I don't think that it's it's just uh, depending on Georgia, it's depending also uh, pretty much on Russia, uh, if they really want to have a stable neighborhood and if they want uh, to engage with Georgia and other post-Soviet countries. Because it's not only Georgia who has the problem uh, with uh, Russia. Um, just look around in the neighborhood and what's going on. It's uh, all uh, actually uh, neighbors, they became victim of uh, Russian aggressive policy recent years. And so it's, uh, the question should be asked uh, also um, that, I mean, what Russia wants, uh, I mean, how they see their regional security, because one thing is clear, in case of Ukraine and Georgia, 
these two countries will never join any Russian-led uh, integration project like Eurasian Union or CSTO or some other, in, uh, you know, like uh, uh, institution. So I think if uh, the, the better, uh, the sooner the Russian uh, uh, political elites understand that, then we will maybe uh, find uh, some uh, ways to communicate with Russia and uh, to have more uh, meaningful dialogue. Mm -hmm. But yeah, let's pick up a couple of more questions and then we do a final round um, and everybody can respond um, or can give a final statement. <clears throat> okay, one more question from Tom Wagen, Wagenmakers. Uh, he says he is a PhD student in Wroclaw, Poland, and he did a European voluntary service at Belisi. So I have warm feelings for the Georgian people. My question is how much does the win of Georgian dream show a continued grip of Ivanishvili to Georgian politics? Can we say that the results of these elections show that he still has most influence or do we have to see the election apart from, this, from his influence? Um, and another direction from a political economist uh, Andreas von A. Oh, okay, I will raise this question in German. Georgi Maizoratze, according to me, has uh, uh, concealed a main problem, at least in the last eight years, the economic development has been misled instead of uh, uh, basing on uh, long-standing uh, traditions as in the agriculture, a huge bubble is emerged uh, by totally excessive investments in the tourism. A long-term strategy is lacking, not only due to the fact that uh, the politicians have their own Vested interests. What solution or idea would he see in order to bring uh, the long term perspective on the agenda? One more question from Tsipilma Darieva. I have a question regarding participation of ethnic minorities in these elections. And is there any cha change in their political behavior over the last 30 years? From Zeus Berlin. Maybe two more questions and then we, <clears throat> if you have. Mm -hmm. um, Johannes Alefeld wants to know from Corneli, it looks like the next government will be led by Georgian Dream again. What does that mean for the development of the country over the next four years? Will it push ahead with further economic and politic political reforms in order to become a front run runner among the ENP countries or stagnation ahead? Um, I would say the other questions are more or less repeat what we had already. So. Then I would um, give it back to, so everybody has a, a short statement. So uh, my impression is that we have a de decline of democracy. Uh, can you just uh, again respond to this question? So what does this election say about the de democratic uh, progress of, of uh, Georgia? Um, and pick up, please, also the, um, the questions which are in your. We start with you, and just in the in the reversed um, uh, order. Um, may, may may I start with just very? Yeah, I, I and do it in the reverse. Order. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, may I start? I'll, I'll just uh, say very uh, shortly and maybe uh, answer it to some. Um, um, uh, to this question. So again, uh, just okay. Then uh, you will start. Okay, but then Connelly, yes, and then uh, I would uh, have this order. Uh, okay. Or if you want, we can start with Cornelli and. I just wanted to do it in a reversed order and, and start with okay. him. Okay, let me start. Okay. Uh, I'll start with the questions uh, about the GD running country and what will be the prospect for uh, Europeanization of country and uh, if Georgia can maintain the status of front runner. I think it's very debatable. Um, I can tell you my subjective view. It will be very difficult, especially if you have so much polarized uh, and uh, uh, you know society, and if you don't have actually opposition in the parliament and you radicalized opposition. I think in order to have a success in Georgia's Europeanization project, uh, you need uh, consensus-based politics, which is missing in Georgian reality. And I don't think that it will lead uh, somewhere else unless uh, this situation it changes and uh, I think um, we uh, I think in general I would say that Georgia is backsliding and that was trend already visible for 
some uh, years and years, but uh, I think now uh, the thing is that Georgia needs a more, how to say, uh, uh, vision, new vision and new strategy in, in terms of uh, um, in, uh, you know, Euro, Euro Atlantic integration. And I think this is also missing and I don't see that present government has any vision uh, to change that uh, dynamic. And there was also a question um, regarding, uh, I think, um, yeah, about ethnic minorities and I'll very, um, you know, uh, answer it very uh, fast. Uh, I think that uh, there was some changes in behavior of ethnic minorities. Uh, if you compare, for instance, how they were engaging in Georgian, uh, you know, uh, elections, it was a kind of tradition that they were always voting for the ruling party. I think that changed in last election when uh, minorities actually, uh, you know, changed their attitudes. Uh, and I think this trend uh, is uh, visible. I don't have now uh, you know, exact data how this, uh, you know, how the minorities actually voted, but I, I will be very surprised if it, if it is not the trend. Mm -hmm. um, Georgi, um, on this long term perspective, I think there was a direct question directed to you. <clears throat> Ja, also was uh, die Perspektive angeht. Uh In terms of the perspective, um, it is mainly uh, attracted attention to tourism, starting off with Saakashvili. But then in the last years, with Svanishvili, he has started off with the building of uh, a new five or even seven star hotels. Uh, he destroyed whole landscapes and parks in order to foster and promote tourism, even uh, during the times of the pandemic, our economic minister was talking about uh, tourism being the one and only project that would save Georgia. And if you listen, you would think that uh, uh, we are um, in a total madhouse against uh, all of reason and common sense uh, tourism is depicted as being the one and only salvation of our economy and um, this hard-headedness we can see here amongst our politicians and if we take a closer look uh, the uh, uh, electoral lists uh, of uh, the georgian dream who are in there leading businessmen who are active in the field of tourism, of course. Um, uh, they're not only participating in the field, they are employees of Ishvanishvili in his bank and in his different financial or economic institutions that he is owning. So it is reflecting the whole picture of him. People that have obtained the power are maintaining their own businesses and so their own economy on the cost of the uh, society. And as long as this system um, pertains, we cannot even think about any alternative, maybe in employment or social projects. Uh, so at least in this reference, Ishvanishvili is uh, the problem himself and the whole system. Um, Elena, yeah, up to very you. important point. Also you also react to uh, maybe also on the ethnic ethnic minorities. I think this is also very important um, uh, issue. Um, and, and the other questions you wanted to react also. Yeah. Well, uh, regarding ethnic minorities, I agree here with Corneli because uh, we have a change um, uh, that observes that uh, behavior of ethnic minorities is changing, and it's it's becoming more di uh, the way they are voting is be uh, is becoming like more diverse. We before we had experience and expectations uh, that uh, they uh, had support for the uh, ruling party, it's definitely um, uh, very different now. And um, uh, they're also supporting uh, opposition political parties, which is definitely change. And uh, of course, shows that uh, there's uh, also more uh, diversity uh, of uh, political parties working and it uh, probably uh, is a result of the political parties themselves are working more with ethnic minorities, which is, uh, of course, a very mm, a positive change um, from their side, because uh, before it was uh, kind of more neglected by uh, political parties also. Mm, but now it's uh, quite mm, uh, well, let's see how it will continue. But at least we have this change and now, it's, which, which is positive. 
And general, um, what I wanted to say is that uh, though we have like definitely we have backsliding uh, with the elections, and as I uh, said, it was very negative elections um, uh, with many many violations, many different violations, quite severe violations, not only during pre-election campaign, also on E-Day. It should be also said the one positive thing is that um, we will have uh, more political parties in the parliament. As I said, it's nine political parties. So maybe with a low number of uh, mandates, which was actually ex expectable, but still these parties will be represented in the parliament, which means that more uh, groups of the society will be represented uh, of the, in the parliament and there will be less uh, lost votes, uh, as we call them, because before we had really this number of lost votes, uh, the number of voters whose will was not reflected in the parliament uh, very high. It could have been like 20%. We had the elections when it was 20%. So now it's uh, definitely lower and uh, it's good. I think it's a good uh, step. It could be a good step forward uh, for the development of uh, democratic processes in the country uh, by making the uh, legislature more diverse with different political uh, positions and more um, like discuss political discussions uh, in the parliament. And of course, from the beginning, it could have some challenges there, but it will, I think, also contribute to increasing political culture in the country. And political parties will start working together, trying to find ways uh, to uh, uh, find like issues of uh, common interest and uh, to work on those issues gently because before what we uh, we are observing is that one party had the uh, all power like full power and could take decisions um, uh, unilaterally. So I think uh, this could be one positive outcome of these elections, like more diversity and more uh, involvement of pol uh, political parties in the uh, political life and decision-making process, which is important. Thank you also for Thank this positive, positive statement in, in the end. I think it's also important to raise. Anna, last word from yours. Yes, I will add also about the ethnic minorities, but not the voters, but representatives of the ethnic mm -hmm. minorities in yeah, parliament. Exactly. I was reading the data about the representation of the ethnic minorities in the parliament. And from the recent elections, um, it seems that the number who represent the ethnic minorities in the parliament are going less. So it's only six candidates uh, that that could be part of the parliament that would voice the ethnic minorities, which is a huge decline to compare to other years. Um, and I think it's, um, it's not a good tendency as well. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, I would like really to thank all the, the speakers. Um, I think this was much more than about the election. Um, uh, I think this was really about also the current state of Georgia and, and where's Georgia heading. Um, and I, I really think um, also from a German and EU side, um, there needs really more engagement. And as also Corneli said it, um, uh, I think there is less. Uh, getting the, 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 the uh, getting the reform process uh, forward. And we have, we, we have a strong civil society in this country, I think. And this was also visible with election observation and around election, um, uh, what role civil society plays in this country. Um, so I, I think um, that needs to be further developed and this needs also to be further support and more attention and also using, using this leverage. And um, again, I would like to thank you for this multi-perspective view on Georgia. I would like to thank um, everybody who, who attended to the uh, event and also asked questions. And I wanted also to thank my colleagues from Heinrich Böll Foundation um, for, for setting this up, uh, the event uh, technically and that, uh, that we have this great discussion. Wish you all a nice evening and uh, let's see what, what comes out um, within the next days. Um, I think this, this stays really um, quite, ten quite a lot of tensions and, and uh, the next days and weeks are really important also for Georgia and how it is going on. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.